Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And today's video is a follow-on from my video on the history of the site of the Tower of London, which I'll leave linked in a card and which I uploaded to YouTube a few weeks ago, before the birth of my son. And in that video, I mentioned that this was a topic that covered a large span of history, and therefore there was going to be details and information that perhaps I couldn't give a full account of. I asked you if you wanted more information to please leave a comment, and you did. And I'm going to slowly work through the topics that you would like me to go into more depth about. And today is the first of that series. I was asked to talk about Tower Hill, its relationship to the Tower of London, and also its own position as a site of execution, with some other information about what is there today. And so that's what I'm doing. I hope you enjoy. Although the Tower of London and Tower Hill are geographically incredibly close to each other, these are separate and distinct sites of execution. However, this I think is somewhat complicated by the fact that on both of these sites, the method of execution and the crime being punished is very similar. The majority of people who lose their lives by execution at the Tower of London and on Tower Hill have been found guilty of treason, and they are going to be beheaded. In this, I think we see quite a lot about who these people are, because as strange as it may sound, beheading was a kindness. It was a commution of a far nastier sentence that was normally doled out in cases of treason. And the reason behind this commution, in most cases, was the social rank of the person about to be executed. These are people who had either been born noble or who in their lifetime had achieved noble rank. Because if you hadn't got this rank and you had been found guilty of treason, your punishment, if you're a woman, would be to be burned alive. And if you're a man, it would be to be hung, drawn and quartered. These were brutal and very, very painful ways to die. Of course, beheading could be botched, but if it wasn't, the thought process was that it was a cleaner, quicker and more painless way to die. It was something that would ensure the dignity of the person who was being punished. The sort of dignity that might be expected for somebody who comes from the noble ranks. According to tradition and the record, the first time that Tower Hill was put to its bloody purpose was not for a state-sanctioned execution. Rather, it was the culmination of an explosion of mob violence, which came on the 14th of June, 1381. The Black Death arrived in Europe in the middle of the 14th century. The official death toll varies depending on who you are reading and referencing, but between one third to one half of the population of Europe are believed to have perished. This illness would recur with monotonous regularity in the decades that followed, including the 1370s. In England, this death toll had a seismic effect on social structure. Medieval society could be broken down and understood fairly simply. There were those who fought, those who prayed, and those who toiled. A number of those who toiled were serfs, or indentured servants, who were unable to leave their lord's land. Plague had, of course, taken from all walks of life, but the fact that it culled the number of toiling hands, particularly when the work to be done did not diminish, offered those toiling hands a possibility to improve their lot. As we are all aware, scarcity drives demand. And in light of this, some of those toiling hands felt emboldened to try to take their labour to the highest bidder. The people who relied on the toiling hands were also the people who held the power, and they were not happy with this new turn of events. Legislation was swiftly passed to subdue the naughty peasants and put them back in their place. The legislation attempts to fix wages at pre-plague levels, and also to give out harsh penalties to anyone who refused to work, or who broke an existing contract. To make matters worse, the country was in a financial hole. The conflict that would come to be known as the Hundred Years' War had been started in the reign of Edward III. This king was attempting to press his claim to the French throne, but war, as always, was an expensive business. This warmongering king, Edward III, 
passed away in 1377. And, of course, after his death, a new king came to the English throne. This time, it was Edward III's grandson, the 10-year-old Richard II. The boy king Richard II inherited a nation that was in trouble. It had been devastated, both in terms of its finances and its population number, by plague and war. Richard also inherited a new form of taxation, known as the poll tax. This poll tax was intended by Richard's grandfather and his government to further support the war effort in France. As this war was still ongoing when Richard came to the throne, the poll tax remained an expedient way to gain the necessary funds to continue the effort. The poll tax was unpopular, as taxes frequently are, but particularly as poll taxes have always proved themselves to be historically. But this poll tax was made even more unpopular because of the way it was enacted, and especially how frequently. The poll tax was levied in 1377, 1379 and 1381. In the first case, every adult over the age of 14 in England had to pay four pence to the king. In 1379, the tax amount would be determined by an individual's wealth. But in 1381, it changed back to being a standard amount for every person, this time over the age of 15. However, in this case, the price had gone up. It was now 12 pence rather than four. By 1381, the poll tax had become so unpopular that people would go to extreme lengths to avoid paying it, from refusing to register to beating up tax collectors. Evidently, the populace was angry. When the government sent commissioners to investigate the reason for the low return from the poll tax, violence erupted. It began in Essex and Kent. The so-called Peasants' Revolt was now underway. The rebels marched on London, gathering support as they went. They claimed that they intended to seek redress for the wrongs they believed the state had done to them. Richard II was just 14 years old, but fortunately he had a selection of councillors around him, and they were apt to be blamed for the perceived evils perpetrated by the regime. The story goes that on the 14th of June 1381, the rebels found a way to get inside the indomitable defences of that concentric castle of the Tower of London. We are told they found a way to breach. I think it's more likely that someone allowed them in. And I think this is given even more credence because they managed to allegedly breach the castle's defences during a time when the king wasn't there. He had gone away from the Tower of London to meet with some rebels at Mile End. However, Richard II had helpfully left behind some of his most hated advisers, including Simon of Sudbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Lord Chancellor of England, and Sir Robert Hales, the Lord High Treasurer. The rebels found these men, and they dragged them from the tower, up to Tower Hill. On Tower Hill, these men were beheaded. Reportedly, it took eight blows in the case of Sudbury. These beheadings are reported to be the first of many that took place on this site. In the case of Sudbury, his severed head was eventually removed to his hometown, and there it remains, in the keeping of St Gregory's Church, Sudbury. The first state-sanctioned beheading on Tower Hill happened seven years after the killings of the Peasants' Revolt. It was done at the behest of the so-called Merciless Parliament, which was a feature of the late 1380s. During this period, Richard II's royal authority had been revoked, and a period of rule by a regency of nobles had begun. Tower Hill's first state-sanctioned victim was Sir Simon Burley. He was impeached for treason and beheaded on Tower Hill in 1388. Between 1388 and 1780, 93 people are confirmed to have been beheaded at the adjacent sites of Tower Hill and the Tower of London. Of these, only seven occurred in the tower itself. This is, of course, not including the other deaths that occurred within the tower, some of them far more subtle, apparently from grief or displeasure. Usually, grief or displeasure is a euphemism for smothering, starving, or a whack to the back of the head. Of the seven beheadings known to have occurred within the Tower of London, the first was not a public one, and it certainly hadn't followed a trial. 
Instead, it was the summary and highly suspect execution of William Lord Hastings in 1483. This killing of Hastings may have come about because Richard, Duke of Gloucester, thought that he would oppose him in usurping the throne from his nephews to become Richard III. However, some argue that Richard was justified because Hastings may have been plotting against Richard's life and his role as protector. The first public execution to take place within the Tower of London was that of Anne Boleyn on the 19th of May 1536. Next came Margaret Pole, Countess of Salisbury, who was executed in the Tower on the 27th of May 1541. The following year, on the 13th of February 1542, Catherine Howard and Jane Boleyn Lady Rochford were both beheaded in the Tower. Lady or Queen Jane Grey lost her life on Tower Green on the 12th of February 1554. The seventh person known to have been beheaded within the Tower of London was Robert Devereux, 2nd Earl of Essex, and he was executed on the 25th of February 1601. What makes these seven people different? Why did some beheadings happen in the Tower and some across the road on Tower Hill? Well, I think principally it's about what the tower represents, what you can do with it. Namely, you can lock it. You can control ingress and egress from the site. You can say who comes in and who goes out. Therefore, you can vet and also limit the eyes for this public spectacle. Of these seven people known to have been beheaded within the Tower of London, five are female. So is sex a deciding factor on where you get beheaded? Perhaps. However, it's worth remembering that in the case of these particular women, they also had a great deal of proximity to the throne, either by marriage, service, or by their own bloodline. And I would say that this probably had as much, if not more, to do with it. These women all had a royal profile, and therefore maintaining their dignity through a degree of privacy may have been seen as being paramount. Sometimes beheadings didn't go to plan they could be botched. And if it went wrong, if it took more than one blow, as it did in the case of Margaret Pole, being able to limit the number of people and even barring foreign dignitaries and diplomats from seeing it made sense. By doing so, perhaps the Crown could vainly hope that any mistake on the part of their executioner, any clumsiness and therefore any perception of their own cruelty, might not be reported too widely abroad. Equally, Limiting who could see an execution could also be valuable if the person being executed had a significantly high profile. Controlling the number of people who could witness an execution of somebody popular, like Robert Devereux, might avoid a potential riot from breaking out, or at least so it was thought. Justice must be seen to be done, but clearly not by everybody who might hope to take a look. If you have been to Tower Hill recently, there are a few things for you to look at. We have the remains of the old Roman wall, some memorials, one for the execution site that was at Tower Hill, and also the Mercantile Marine First World War Memorial and the Merchant Seamen's War Memorial. Tower Hill may also be the place that you re-emerge to street level if you have come to visit the Tower of London by public transport, because that is where the tube station is. Alternatively, you may have arrived by bus or, of course, by the Docklands Light Railway, and that station is just across the road. But what do you think about this follow-up? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversation in the comments section underneath the video. Or you can come and find me over on my social media. I'll leave links to my Instagram and Twitter in the description box. Follow me there and we can continue this conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, then please let me know by hitting the thumbs up. Please also subscribe to this channel. And while you're there, hit the notification bell that's beside the subscribe button so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing. And I look forward to speaking to you in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.